And then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. Uh, the cup which my father uh, hath given me, shall I not drink it? We talked about that last week, cutting off the ear, and the, uh, the week before, and the cup um, uh, that he must drink. We talked about that. Verse 12. And the band and the captain of and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, uh, for he is the father-in-law of Caiaphas, which is the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he that gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. Now notice here, Annas, he, he is father-in-law of Caiaphas. He was the, the previous high priest, if you read about him, which we will. What I wanted to do is I want to show you something interesting that you may have not thought about as we get later in the scriptures about these two people here and this group of high priests is here. Okay, so this is what I want you to see here. Turn over to uh, Matthew 26. Let's read about these two. Matthew 26. Look at verse number 57. Matthew 26, 57. It says, uh, And they that laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. Uh, but Peter followed him afar off uh, unto the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. And the chief priests and the elders and all the council saw false witness against Jesus to put him to death. Now that's important. They didn't, they didn't have any witnesses, so they had to set up false witnesses. Uh, to me, you, you see a picture. I'm, I'm trying to paint a full picture. I don't know if I have time today. Uh, uh, I want to lay out an argument this morning. If I can, if you'll stay with me and let me systematically look, emphasize certain things as we go along. But notice they didn't have anybody, anybody to accuse them, so they had to set up false witnesses. Verse number 60, but found none. They didn't even have somebody who had a false accusation. So they had to invent one. Look at this. Yea, though many false witnesses came, notice there's no true witness, they're all found to be false, yet uh, they found none. At last came two false witnesses. Here we go. And they said, this uh, fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? Of course, he's led like a sheep to a slaughter, so opened he not his mouth, said in Isaiah. 53. So in, in regards to answering him here, he, it's a fulfillment of scripture. He does answer. But again, the answer, him not answering originally, fulfills Isaiah 53. And the high priest rose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? Uh, what is it which these witnesses, these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether uh, thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, uh, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? And they answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him. Others smote him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy in us, thou Christ, who is he, who is he that smote thee? What, what a horrible scene is being painted here. Turn over to the book of Luke, Luke chapter number 3. We see that Caiaphas is right in the middle of all this. Luke 3. Luke 3. We also know that Caiaphas also had the witness of John the Baptist. Luke chapter number 3. Luke 3. Luke chapter number 3. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod the tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Ithria, and, and of the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, uh, the tetrarch of Abilene. Notice the two that are here. Verse number two. 
Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, notice how is that so? Think about this for a minute. One is the prior high priest, they're in a transition, and Caiaphas is the next high priest, being his son-in-law. Okay? So notice this. Caiaphas and uh, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, uh, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness, and came into the country of Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. As it is written in the book of the, uh, the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So Caiaphas has to set up false witnesses. And then we see prior to that, he had the testimony of John the Baptist, telling him that I'm the forerunner of this Christ that would come testimony of John the Baptist. And it just seems like there is such a strong testimony in Caiaphas. How could he not get it? How could he not get it? Up? It gets worse. It doesn't get better. It gets worse. I want to show you something uh, that you might have not have thought about. John chapter number 11. John 11. John chapter 11. Let's put this piece of the puzzle in here. John 11, verse number 47. He says, Then gathered the chief priests and, and the Pharisees a council and said, uh, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him uh, thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take, both, uh, what, take away both our uh, place and nation. One of the high priests named Caiaphas, being, or one of, the, one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest the same year, said unto them, you know nothing at all, for nor consider that it's expedient for us that one should die for the people and the whole nation, uh, that the whole nation perish not. For this he spake not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. So, interesting. Think about this. Think about this. Here he is. God is using him in spite of himself. And in spite of his rejection of God's word, these high priests knew the prophecies in the Old Testament. Think about the man that's here. But you know what he was more interested in than the truth of God's word? A place in a nation. Yeah. He was more interested in position than telling these people the truth of God's word. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is when we have a false motive, the Bible says if the light that be in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? Oftentimes, God turns the dimmer on in our lives. He cranks down the light because we reject what he has given us. Listen, you be careful in your life. When God begins to reveal to you what is the truth, ever how big or small the congregation, if the preacher is telling you the truth, you stick with it. If he's not telling you the truth, you need to find somewhere where he's telling you the truth. That's just how it is. Let me say something to you. It's not about numbers. It's not about a place or a nation. It's about this man should have been telling these people there is a fulfillment of prophecy. This is what we need to be looking for. And it appears that these are being fulfilled with this guy right here in front of us. That's what he should have been saying. And he wasn't. So we fast forward. Acts chapter 4. Do you realize that Caiaphas is in Acts chapter number 4? After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know that the disciples are confronted with this guy again. And I want you to notice what he does not deny. Okay? Acts chapter number 4. Look at verse number 1. I have to do a little reading on this one, but it'll be okay. It says, that, and as they spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them. And, and now listen to me. Why would that be a strange thing? Why would that be a strange thing? Job, Job said, hey, the worms are going to eat this flesh, but I know I know in my flesh, I, I'm going to see, I'm going to see God. 
You know why Daniel said there's going to be a resurrection of the just and the unjust in Daniel chapter number 12? Why would he think it's a strange thing that there's a resurrection? Why would that even be an issue? There's a group of Sadducees here that reject all that. They're heretics. And they reject the resurrection and angels and all of this. So there's a group here that, again, he's stirring, he keeps stirring up the crowd. Even though these Pharisees should have said, we don't care what you say. The high priest should have said, we don't care what you Sadducees think about. It. The Bible says this. The Word of God says this. And there's something different about this man. But they did. There's a, a place and a nation. we got to be careful uh, when people take a position, to have a position, and they don't take that position because they intend to tell people what the Word of God says. It ain't always easy to stand up here and say what's right. But it's always right. Amen. And so, again, if the preacher's going to be obedient, sometimes he has to say some things he knows people are not going to lie. And so these men should have said, no, this is right. This is the right way. What they're saying is right. But let's look here. And they, uh, verse number three, they laid hands on them and put uh, them in, in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them uh, which heard the word believed, and the word of the, uh, the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass, a number of men, and it came to pass on the, the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, look, look who's here, verse 6, and Annas and the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander, as many as were the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power... Or by what name have you done this? Now, here's a, this is amazing. So people get healed, get straightened out in their lives, and you reject the truth of God's word because you don't like the fact that they're doing it in somebody's name that you don't like. A person you just tried to have killed, here he is, a testimony of the resurrection, and you've got men standing before you saying, the one you killed is the name we're healing this man in. But he rose from the dead. Listen, how much of a testimony do you need? Here's a man made a whole who sat before you in your midst. He's been healed. How much more of a testimony? You know what? Some of us have been healed from horrible things in your life. And they ask you, what happened to you? What, what happened to Mike Austin? The one I knew 25 years ago, he wasn't like that. And you begin to testify that it was Jesus that did it. Boy, they get upset with that. They don't like that. You can say it was AA, you can say it was NA, and they'll applaud you. That's great. But if you say, Jesus delivered me from that sin, listen, I don't stand up and say, I am an alcoholic. I am a drug addict. See, that, the, 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 those chains stay there with those. I, I'm not against people trying to help people get cleaned up, okay? You understand that. Sometimes you just got to get to that point where you can understand the gospel. What I'm saying is Jesus sets people free, and you're no longer that. You're no longer that. But notice what it says here. Verse number 6. And Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, Alexander, as many were the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power and by what name have you done this? Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto him, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done unto the impotent man, and by what means he is made whole, be it known unto all, uh, to you all, and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, and they did. They did. He went before Caiaphas and Annas, and they, they condemned him. Verse 10 again. Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Woo! You know that was stinky. Yes. You know that was that chap somebody's hide right there. You crucified him. But I got news for you, buddy. 
500 of us at one time saw him arose from the dead. 500 of us. He appeared in our midst. You crucified him, but God rose him from the dead. Amen. Now, Peter, I, you say what you want to say about Peter. People give him a hard time about doubting. But man, after he got that thing right, Peter is bold. He's got, I, I admire him standing before them. But I want you to notice, you'll not find a denial. You'll not find them denying that that's what they did. You'll not find them to find that, uh, 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 denying that he rose from the dead. Here are the enemies of Jesus Christ. And they can't say, no, he didn't rise from the dead. You would think that's what they would say. You would think they would argue with Peter, no, nah, he didn't rise. You lost your mind. But you know what? Peter just plows on. Look here. Be it known unto you all, and, 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 and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom he crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. And this is the stone which is, was set at naught of you builders, which uh, is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Uh, now, when uh, they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. <laughs> you listen, when people ain't got nothing to say against you, you know what they'll just start saying? You're just ignorant. You just don't know. You haven't studied our evolution theory and you haven't been to our college and you're just a common man. Well, you really don't know anything about me, thank you. But the truth is, They'll do you the same way. Didn't faze them. They took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Woo! You know that's got kind of burned. Here he is standing before him. They took knowledge that he had been with Jesus. It's after his resurrection. And this man still gives us a fit. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and, uh, again, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. What? what? That guy just in front of everybody said, you crucified him, but he rose from the dead by his name this man is made whole. And you know what the Bible says? They could say nothing against it. You would think if there was something to say against it, they would have been saved. But they weren't. Look at verse 15. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them uh, is manifest to all that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, that it straightly threaten them, that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor preach or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right, in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than to God judge ye. But we, we cannot but speak the things which we had seen and heard. Eyewitness testimony. You know what he said? They threaten them. That's what they'll do. They'll threaten them. We're going to see later they're going to beat them. You know what these men do after they threaten them? Thank you. Whether it be right in sight of God for us to hearken to you or God, you judge. You know what they did? Went out and kept them. You know what they did after they're going to be beat here in a little bit? They're going to go out and keep preaching. You know what the result of them going out and keep preaching is going to bring? We're going to see a young man that's among this crowd that's going to be converted. And his name is going to be Paul, Saul, Saul of Tarsus. A man of their own people, own group of Pharisees, is going to be converted and begin to speak against them. 
If it wasn't enough that Peter's already doing it, it wasn't enough that John the Baptist foran and told him the truth. Here they are, constantly trying to, but notice what's not written here. No denial. No denial at all. John, uh, Acts 5. Acts 5. We see it again, Acts 5. Notice the group that's here in verse 17, and the high priest rose up. So that's the group that's here. Verse 29, and then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. Why do they say that? Because Peter begins to accuse them again. Again of murdering the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 28. Saying, did not we straightly command thee not to teach in the name in this name? And behold, we you fill Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. <laughs> oh. But notice, there's no denial in this whole chapter that exactly what they said was true. There's no denial that there was a resurrection of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 33. When they heard that, actually, let's read down, verse 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted uh, with his right hand to be a prince and a savior and to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. And we are his witnesses of these things. Uh, so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them uh, that obey him. And when they heard the, uh, that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. You know what? That's stop them. So here, they threaten them at first. Now they're taking counsel to slay them. And they're going to wind up beating them. If you'll notice verse 40, they beat them. But verse 41 said, and they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name and daily in the temple and in every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Didn't stop them. They're threatened. Now they're beaten. They, listen, if they weren't eyewitnesses of this, these are insane people. Right? Right? But notice what you don't see in Acts chapter 5. You do not see a denial. You know what happens when you get to Acts chapter number 6? Acts chapter number 6, they're choosing out what a lot of people say is the first deacons. Acts chapter number 6. And one of those is Stephen. Verse number nine. Then arose certain of the synagogue, which is called, uh, which is called the synagogue of the uh, Libertines and the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians, and them of Sicily and of Asia, disputing, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit which he spake. And they suborned men, which said, "Suborn men." What does that mean? What does that word "suborn" mean? means they they went and secured some people to give a false oath. That's what suborn means. So here's false witnesses again, false testimony again. Look at this. And they suborn men which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God and they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and, the, uh, and came upon him and, and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against the holy, this uh, holy place and the law. For we have heard them say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the custom which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as if it had been the face of an angel. Look where he's at. Then said the high priest, are these things so? You know what Stephen does? He preaches such a message. He starts historically, starts from 
way in the beginning and begins to give them historical fact after fact and preaches such a wonderful message. As far as I can tell, the only one he seemed to be able to preach before he got his self killed. And we see, look at verse 51, you stiff necked and uncircumcised heart here, do you always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did so to you? Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted them, slain uh, them, which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye are now betrayers and murderers, whom, uh, uh, who have received the law by a disposition of angels and have not kept it? Woo! He said they were cut to the heart. You know what he says? How long? You know who he's standing before? Same crowd, chief priest. You know who he's saying? That whole crowd, Annas and Caiaphas and that whole crowd. He said, how long are you going to resist the Holy Ghost? John the Baptist, Peter, Caiaphas inadvertently prophesying on behalf of Jesus Christ. And he says, how long are you going to resist the Holy Ghost? You've heard the testimony of his resurrection. You've heard the men testify that he rose from the dead. How long are you going to resist the Holy Ghost? They don't like that. But you know what? Here we are. They kill Stephen. And you know who's there? A man among them. Pharisee, and he begins, he has an experience, God has a purpose for him, as if the testimony wasn't strong enough with all those people. You know what he begins to do? Look at verse number 1, chapter 8. Saul was consenting to his death, and that at that time there were great persecution against the church of Jerusalem, and they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, made great lamentation over him. Saul, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they were scattered abroad and every uh, everywhere preaching the word. Notice this. Here he is. There's a young man of the Pharisees, Paul, the apostle. Saul is his name here. He's there when Stephen dies, and he has got an agenda. And that agenda includes killing every one of these Christians he can. Look at chapter number uh, 9. Chapter number 9. And Saul, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went into the high priest and desired of them letters to Damascus uh, and to the synagogues that if he found any in this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. He got permission. But notice what happened on his way. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. You know what happened? He gets converted here. There's a light that shines. God has a purpose for him. He said, listen, Caiaphas would not listen to all these people. So now I'm going to take one of his own crowd. I'm going to personally reveal myself to him as a testimony against him that he didn't kill my son. My son yielded his life and he rose from the dead and I'm going to give a testimony to Caiaphas that he's very well alive. And you know what? Look, 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 look at this. Look what it says here. Verse number four. And he fell on the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the prick. Woo, Jesus. Think about that. We adjure you not to teach in this name. You're not going to teach in this name. They threaten them. You're not going to teach in this name anymore. They beat them. You're not going to teach in this name. And yet Peter says there's none other name 
under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And you know what? Here's one of their own crowds. And Jesus said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutes. Isn't that amazing? God, it's almost like God had a plan. He knew what he was doing. He tried to give them a testimony that was so strong to open their eyes. Somebody of your own crowd. And you know what Paul starts doing? He gets beat. He gets all, all kind of stuff happens to him. And you know all he does? Look, I'm just, I'm just telling you what happened. And he goes before ruler after ruler after ruler just saying, look, this." you see him repeat this story two other times. He said, this is what happened to me. I, I, I don't know. This is what happened. Here's a guy killing Christians. What greater testimony? Killing Christians and the very name that he's persecuting. Now he's saying, I'm one of them. What a testimony. Listen. You don't find that with other religions. You don't find that kind of strong testimony. You only find it with Christianity. The truth of the Bible is incredible how much resistance there was against it. And God still began to deal with the people that were resisting it, trying to get them to get their eyes open. Listen, there is no other book, there's no other testimony that is as strong as the testimony that you see that Jesus rose from the dead. It was foretold. It was denied that it would happen. It was rejected. And then you see after the fact, people are keeping their mouths shut. They're keeping their mouths shut because they know. Listen, think about the testimony. What kind of testimony was there of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Think about his innocence. For a minute. The centurion at the cross. He said surely this is the son of God. Judas repented. And said that he didn't want to have nothing to do with that. Pilate said he was innocent. Drusilla's wife had a dream. Telling him not to have anything to do with that just man. The thief on the cross gave testimony that this guy is not like us. In fact, so strong, he said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He recognized who he was. Herod, Herod said, I can't find anything wrong with him. The testimony. And to beat it all, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, I'll close right here for Sunday school hours. Um, listen, don't you let somebody talk you out of your Bible and, and talk to you in such a way that it's just a cheap, uh, weak testimony. It's not. It's a strong testimony. His enemies were turned, some of them. His enemies themselves. Pilate's not a friend of Jesus. Drusilla's not a friend of Jesus. Herod's not a friend of Jesus. Judas turned out not to be a friend, but they all said he's innocent. First right. Corinthians 15. Paul says, More of a brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which you are, uh, are saved, and ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest ye believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Caiaphas, that's Peter, or Cephas, sorry, Cephas, which is Peter, then of the twelve, and after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep. Who is saying these words? Paul. The one you see converted there in Acts is the one giving these words. He's saying, look, this is what I realized. There's an awfully strong testimony after I talked to the brethren. 500 of them, and many of them are still alive now, said he rose from the dead, and they saw him all at once. 
That's a strong witness, isn't it? Amen? Amen. Amen. So I want to take you through that with Caiaphas and show you. Um, show you the testimony against Caiaphas, who he is. You follow him through the scriptures. and he, It's amazing that he didn't get converted. You know, you, you, you scratch your head and say, why don't people believe? Man, look at some of the testimony God gave people in the scriptures, and they still didn't believe. It's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Amen. Let's take a break.